In the year 2000, I achieved a lifelong career goal. I became the publisher of a major book publishing company, Nelson Books. Jeff mentioned it a moment ago. It's a division of Thomas Nelson Publishers. What I discovered a few days into the job is that that, that division was dead last in revenue growth. In fact, the division was shrinking. We were also dead last in profit margin. We had lost money the previous year. And as you can imagine, team morale was at an all-time low because people like winning and we weren't winning. What I didn't fully appreciate at the time, this was a blessing in disguise. I couldn't screw it up, right? It could only get better from there. So the CEO asked me after a couple weeks in the job, he said, how long is it going to take you to turn this division around? And he was kind of known for being impatient. I didn't have a clue, but I pulled a number out of the air, kind of looked thoughtful, and I said, I think it's going to take us three years. And he said, that's pretty much what I thought. You got it. So I went back to the team. I told him exactly where we were. I painted a vision for a bigger, better future, and we worked hard. We rolled up our sleeves. We were working nights and weekends, 70 to 80 hours a week, but it paid off. It didn't take three years to turn that division around. We did it in a year and a half. And the thing that was really exciting was that everybody got their bonus checks, but the division went from number 14 to number one in terms of revenue growth, from number 14 to number one in profit margin, team morale through the roof. I got a bonus check that was bigger than at the time my annual salary. I couldn't wait to get home and share it with my wife, Gail. So I bounced into the house, and I, and I, I gotta tell you just a little bit about Gail before I tell you the story. She's super supportive, always been my biggest cheerleader. She's the, always the one that's, this, the, that's the most enthusiastic about what I do. So I just knew that she would be excited. But when I shared with her this check, she was less than her enthusiastic self. There was just kind of a hitch in her giddy-up. She was holding back. And I'm thinking to myself, are you kidding me? You know, you've seen how hard I've worked for this. How about a little celebration? I was getting none of that. And then she uttered the five words that every married person dreads hearing from their spouse. Honey, we need to talk. <laughs> I sighed followed her dutifully into the den, and we sat down. And she began to tear up. And she said, you know I love you. And I'm grateful for your hard work. But I've got to be honest. You're never home. And your five daughters need you. And then she said, even when you are home, you're not really here. And then she began to cry, and she said, I feel like a single mom. That slew me. I wanted to defend myself, but I knew she was right. I thought I'd reached the pinnacle of success, but what I discovered in that moment was that it was a false summit. Yeah, I was... Crushing it at work, but work was crushing my family. At work, I was working like crazy. I was seeing growth and all that, and I didn't want to lose my chance to lead. I was in the dream job of my life. And besides my team, they'd worked so hard with me for the last 18 months, they were counting on me. But on the other hand, there was my family. Gail and the girls, they needed me too. And I felt like I was facing the impossible choice. You can win at work or you can succeed at life. You can't have both. Pick one. Now, I think most of us, when we're faced with that choice, we do one of two things. First, we hustle harder. We think if I can just move faster, work smarter, keep grinding, I'll eventually succeed, and then I can relax. But working more just leads to neglect. Neglect of our health, neglect of our most important relationships, neglect of our personal dreams. And it's a certain path to burnout. And it's one-sided success. 
The alternative is to cut back. We're unwilling to shortchange our health or our family life for our work, so we intentionally throttle back our ambition. The problem with that is it leads to wasted potential, unfulfilled dreams, and a whole lot of regret. And for people like you and me that are high achievers, that love our work and want to make a dent in the world, that's a bitter pill to swallow, and it's still one-sided success. Every day at Michael Hyatt and Company, we encounter leaders just like you who've been told they have to choose. And just like I was in the den with Gail, they don't want to choose. But they're facing the impossible choice. Well, after that emotional encounter with Gail, I began to wonder, what if I didn't have to choose? That question sent me on a quest to find a third way, a way that wouldn't cost me my career or my family, one that would free me from the impossible choice, and I call this the double win. When you're unwilling to compromise your contribution at work or at home, you find that they're actually symbiotic. Your work gives you confidence and joy and the financial resources to support your family. But your health and a happy home life give you a clear mind, greater creativity and a rested body to bring to work. That's the double win, and it's not a myth. I've spent almost two decades now developing a system that enables you to win at work and succeed at life. We've coached thousands of leaders through this system. We've seen them multiply their revenue while slashing their work hours, which maybe to some of you sounds impossible. They've achieved unprecedented success in their professional and in their personal lives. It's possible. You just need a new approach. Look, I believe that no one should have to choose. It's possible for everyone in this room today to win at work and succeed at life. And there's a simple four-step system that makes that possible. Taking me almost two decades to develop this system and the time I've got remaining, I want to share this with you as much of it as I can because I really want this for you. I mean, what good would it do to get to the end of your life, build a great business, and destroy your health or destroy your family? Or to throttle back on your ambition and have that wasted potential. I want you to suspend disbelief for just a minute and assume that it's possible to do it all. But it does take a different approach. If you want to change the trajectory of your work and your life, if you want to change that trajectory, you can't do it by running harder or faster. That's just the hustle fallacy. Because it may be one thing this week, and I lied to my wife for years. I told her, honey, wait till we just get this new initiative going. Then I can relax and spend more time at home. How many of you have done this? Right? You know, as soon as we get this new product into the marketplace, as soon as I get this new person on my team acclimated and up to speed, and we become captive to what appears to be temporary but has a way of becoming permanent, and years can pass, decades can pass, and before long our life passes. I don't want that for you, I don't want that for me. If we're going to make a difference, we've got to stop, and this is step one, plan. We've got to think about what we want that's different. If you don't design the future you want, you're going to drift to a destination you would not have chosen. I want to say that again. It's probably the most important thing I'll say while we're here together today. If you, des if you do not design the future you want, you will drift to a destination you would not have chosen. So you've got to have a vision. A vision. So what does vision mean? I've got a new book coming out this spring, the end of March, called The Vision Driven Leader. 
And I really think it's going to be my most important book because everything rises and falls on vision. Because it's where we begin to create or change the future. And it's not as mysterious as you think. Vision just means standing in the future and describing a better, more compelling reality. And I'm going to talk to you about how to do that. Steve Jobs was a master at this. Probably not everybody in this room is an Apple fanatic like I am. I see some apples in the room. But um, Steve Jobs was a master at this, this whole idea of vision. At his memorial service, his wife, Loreen, said this about him. And I'm just going to read this from the monitor. It's hard enough to see what is already there. To remove the many impediments to a clear view of reality. But Steve's gift was even greater. He saw clearly what was not there, what could be there, what had to be there. His mind was never a captive of reality. Which was true. Quite the contrary. He imagined what reality lacked and set out to, re to remedy it. You and I have to do the same thing. What does reality lack? Your reality, your business reality, your personal reality. What does it lack? How can you remedy it? There's a simple process for crafting a vision, but this process was transformative for one of our clients, Dan Arnsberger, who's in our coaching program. He took his business in the first 12 months of our program after coming to Nashville, and we walked through this whole thing about creating a vision for his company and for his life. His business went from 20 million in revenue to 45 million in the first 12 months. This year, he's on track to do 75 million in revenue, all the while taking more vacation time than he's ever taken in his career. His wife said to me, I've got my husband back. That's the double win in action. Okay, so what's involved in crafting your vision? First, imagine a future reality. Now, all of us have this amazing, God-given faculty called imagination, where we can envision something better, something bigger than what we currently have. But you know how most of us use that faculty? To worry, right? It's the same exact faculty. We, we imagine the worst case scenario. And then we wonder why we kind of drift toward that. I remember a friend of mine telling me one time that he was learning how to drive a race car, one of those places where guys like us can go and pay money and drive a car that we couldn't other, otherwise drive. And so he had somebody next to him and he said, now look, you're going to be going into that turn at over 100 miles an hour. And he said, oh, there's only one thing you need to do. Do not look at the wall. Do not look at the wall. And so as he went into that, he started looking at the wall. The guy who was with him, the instructor, took his helmet and pushed his head away from the wall. And he went around the turn. We oftentimes crash into what we fixate on. So what if instead we could imagine a bigger, better reality? To use that God-given faculty to imagine something better for our companies and for our lives. Then what? Write down what you see. This is the missing ingredient. I mean, maybe you get, you know, inspired, you know, you're in some beautiful location and you think about what could be, but you got to capture it. You got to write it down. And here's the magic of writing. Thoughts disentangle themselves, passing over the lips and through pencil tips. That famous poet Anonymous said that. Thoughts disentangle themselves, passing over the lips and through pencil tips. There's something about writing something down that forces clarity. Plus, as an added benefit, as a business owner, as a CEO, it gives you a way to share the vision. People can't read your mind. So write it down. Third, state it in the present tense. State the vision in the present tense. As it turns out, based on brain research I've read, your mind can't distinguish between something that's vividly imagined and something that you're actually experiencing. 
This is why today in the world of pro athletics, visualization exercises are such an important part of their practice routine, visualizing the outcome they want. But to write it in the present tense as though it were already a reality is just a way, a little way of hacking your brain to believe that it's coming to pass. Feels a little bit awkward, a little bit disingenuous at the first, like a coat that's oversized that doesn't quite fit. But as you begin and begin to move towards that reality, you find that it fits more and more. So this is the process of visioneering. Keep in mind, your vision needs to be multidimensional. I, I don't actually believe in a vision statement and I don't know about you, but I, I've, I've been through exercises before where somebody wanted to get me to, to create a vision statement for my company. Something short, something pithy, something clever. And I never felt like I had anything that was really pithy and clever. You know, it just was either too broad and ambiguous or it just, you know, was, was too niche and, and nobody really understood it. What I advocate creating is a vision script. But you need a vision, like let's say paragraph, for all the different areas of your life where you want to see success. I'm going to give you some examples. So let's just, for example, imagine that you're running a technology firm, and here might be your vision paragraph about that. My technology firm generates seven million a year in revenue because I have an extraordinary team. I'm able to focus on the work I love and am uniquely qualified to do. As a result, I achieve more by doing less. My business gives me the opportunity to fulfill my calling and affords me the freedom to pursue my most important priorities. The first step in creating reality to, is to envision it and then to write it down and to begin to speak it. Here's another example. This one comes right out of my life plan, but this is my vision for my marriage. Gail's my best friend, my intimate ally, and my lifelong partner. My love for her grows daily. We share with one another, our deepest dreams, our secret fears, and our most profound experiences. We're always learning new things together. Though not perfect, our marriage is a model and an encouragement to others. And again, these are just examples. Yours are going to look different. Physical. I'm in the best shape of my life. My heart is strong and healthy. I've never felt better. I have more than enough energy to accomplish the tasks I undertake. This is because I control my mental focus, work out five days a week, choose healthy foods, and schedule time for rest and rejuvenation. It's got to start with your vision. What do you want for your life? Do you agree that there's this interplay, this interchange between all these different dimensions? I mean, if you get sick or your health crashes, it has a business impact. Am I right? Absolutely. On the other hand, if work is stressful, it has an impact on your most important relationships. When you got problems in your relationships, it affects everything. That's why you've got to have a comprehensive, multidimensional vision. It all matters. Failure to cast a vision in all domains of life is one of the biggest reasons why people experience one-sided success. They get a great vision for their company. They go all in on it, committing all their attention, their time, their capital, and it's no wonder that they experience health crises and relationship crises. Now, the best way to chart that, that vision or a path to that vision is through goal setting. Now, the problem is that goal setting can be a mixed bag, right? Because we've all set New Year's resolutions. How many of you have failed to achieve a New Year's resolution? Let's pretend we're on the honest planet, okay? So we're not even out of January yet, right? And so um, I, I work out at a gym a couple miles from here, Lifetime Fitness, and I kind of always dread the beginning of January because that's when it's hard to find a parking place. Because all, I call them the resoluters, all the people that want to lose weight, that want to get in shape, they show up. God bless them. But I know that in about two weeks, there'll be plenty of parking spaces because they're going to quit. So I'm not talking about New Year's resolutions. I'm talking specifically about goals. And there's a couple reasons why goal setting, traditional goal setting, doesn't work. The first is that the goals aren't properly stated. Now listen to me carefully. 
A goal well conceived is a goal half achieved. A goal well conceived is a goal half achieved. You have to state your goals in a specific format if you're going to get the result. It's not enough to state them in this format because it's going to take more than stating them in this format. But this format will help you dial it in and give you a running shot at achieving it. GE, as you probably know, General Electric, pioneered the SMART goal system back in the mid-80s. Everybody heard of that, the SMART goal system? We've all tried various iterations. Well, not that many, really? Okay, there you go. But based on the latest goal achievement research, it's lacking critical elements. In fact, one of the elements that I'm going to share with you in just a minute, if you screw this up, if you get this wrong, it will actually inhibit your ability to achieve the goal. Okay, so I want to walk through this. I use a system called the Smarter Goal System. So I build upon and borrow from the GE model, but I add to it the latest goal achievement research and specifically in a couple different points. First of all, your goal. It needs to be specific. Vague, ambiguous goals don't work. The more specificity you can put on it, the better off you're going to be. You want it to be specific. You want it to be measurable. When in doubt, affix a number or a percentage. This is important for a couple of reasons. First of all, you want to be able to measure your progress. You got to define the win on the front end. How will you know if you've crossed the goal line if you don't define it in advance? And it gives you a cause for celebration when you do. There's something about measuring the goals, making it measurable, that kind of creates this built-in momentum. Then the goal needs to be actionable. And by that, I mean that every properly formatted goal should start with a verb. I'm not going to give you a grammar lesson, but it needs to be an action verb. Avoid words like be, am, have. Like, for example, this year, I want to be in better health. That's not actionable. You know, run a half marathon, eat for keto on 30 days. You know, start with a verb that's an action verb. Earn 1.2 million in net income. Earn, that's actionable. Then your goal needs to be risky. Now, this is where I depart from the GE model. Because in the general electric model, what does the R stand for? Realistic. Realistic is overrated. All the goal achievement research, and there's been many studies of this, and in my book, Your Best Year Ever, I talk about this, many studies on this topic. Your goals need to be in the discomfort zone. If they're just in your comfort zone, they're not going to ignite your imagination. They're not going to compel your best effort. They're not going to compel your focus. They're not going to be exciting to anybody. And goals that are set in your comfort zone are more likely than not to be accomplished. They won't be accomplished. So you got to dial it up to your discomfort zone. Now, I'm not talking about your delusional zone. And there's a difference. So the way we set goals at my company is we typically set them in the comfort zone, we ask ourselves, and then we just dial it up a few clicks. Here's how you know if you're in the discomfort zone. You're going to feel three negative emotions, or I should say one of three, or maybe all three of these emotions, but these are positive indicators that your goal is in the right zone. You're going to feel a little bit of fear, like, whoa. Whoa. What if we don't achieve that? You know, am I going to be, am I going to publicly humiliate myself or with my team? So a little bit of fear. Not terror, not hysteria, but a little bit of fear is a good thing. Uncertainty is another emotion. Like, I don't even know how we could accomplish that. That's a good thing because that forces innovation. If you can clearly see the path, if you know exactly how to achieve that goal, that it's not in your discomfort zone. Here's another emotion that people often feel is doubt. You know, they wonder, do I have what it takes? Do I have the leadership to pull this off? Do I have the knowledge, the experience, 
the skill. If you feel any of those emotions, pat yourself on the back. Congratulations. That's a goal that's set where it needs to be set. That's going to galvanize your team. That's going to create engagement around the goal. But again, I want to make it clear, not in the delusional zone. You know, if when you share the goal, people feel those three emotions, that's good. If they roll their eyes and disengage, you've gone too far. Okay? So it needs to be risky. Time keyed. Time keyed. In other words, put a date on it. A goal without a date is just a dream. But dates drive a sense of urgency. It also defines a win in advance. And I mean, think of how much stuff you wouldn't get done if it weren't for a deadline. Deadlines are our friends, and you need them in goals. Then the goal needs to be exciting. How many times have you had a goal just because you thought you should, but you're not excited about it? This is a good marker of a goal that's correctly formulated. It needs to be exciting to you. I had a woman in one of my coaching groups who was struggling with a goal, and she said, I need some coaching on this. She said, I'm just not excited, and I just, like, I've missed the deadline once, and I've pushed it out once, and I don't really know what the problem is. And I said, well, what's the goal? She said, I need to get caught up with my company's accounting. And she was a solopreneur, and she was having to do it herself. And I said, okay, now I'm thinking to myself, that's not exciting to me. You know, that wouldn't get me excited at all. But, I, but, you know, people are different. I said, are you excited by that goal? She said, heck no. And I said, then what you have is a project, not a goal. Every goal is a project, but not every project is a goal. Reserve that language for a goal, for something that's a new initiative, something that's outside the whirlwind, something that gets you excited, because it's going to take extra resources. It's going to take focus to achieve it. So it needs to be exciting. Then it needs to be relevant. And by relevant, every goal should be relevant to the other goals in the sense that you're trying to accomplish more than one thing at a time. You can't have a goal that's so big and so demanding that you don't have space for the other goals. That's a built-in recipe for disaster. The goal has to be relevant or aligned with your core values. If it's not, you'll self Sabotage. So, smarter goals. But you don't just need smarter goals. You also need commitment. How many of you remember that book that came out several years ago called The Secret? Remember that book? Anybody remember that? Um, I so wanted that book to be true. Because the book was all about the law of attraction. And, And there's probably something to it. But basically the idea was, you know, you get clear on what you want. You kind of throw it out there to the universe, and then it'll come to you. It'll just kind of like happen. I mean, wouldn't that be cool if that worked? That's not been my experience. Has that been anybody's experience here? No. I mean, usually it takes some commitment to follow through on our goals. I mean, the goal part of it's half part of it, but the commitment is the other part of it. But people typically work in one of two modalities, either commitment or convenience. You know, I'm going to commit it, commit to it, I'm going to make it happen, Or I'm going to do it when it's convenient, when I get a little more time. But you notice that time never comes, right? So you got to decide by which standard are you going to live, commitment or convenience. When would now be a good time for you to commit to planning a different outcome? In all these different domains of your life, it's never been easier than it is right now. The longer you wait, the harder it is. That brings us to step number two, focus. Focus. Step number one, vision. Step number two, focus. I want to go back to the honest planet for a minute. And let's just admit, we've all got more tasks than we have time. Do you ever feel like when you're looking at your task list that you're playing some kind of perverse game of whack-a-mole? You know, like every time you check off this thing, two more pop up. You know, no good deed goes unrewarded. In one study of 1,000 professionals, 94% clocked more than 50 hours a week. Well, that's not that big a deal, right? I mean, 50 hours a week. Some of you, that would feel like a vacation. But half worked more than 60 hours a week. 
And professionals with smartphones, that would be everybody here, work more than 70 hours a week. Because in your pocket is an amazing computer with inboxes, calendars, all kinds of apps and distractions. I, I can remember back when I bought my first smartphone. The way I justified it to myself is I said, probably the same thing you guys said, it's going to save me time. <laughs> no, you know, no smartphone ever created ever saved me time. What it has done is made it so that I'm always on, Right? Like I can never unplug because of the smartphone. And that's where professionals are at today. Most leaders are trying to figure out how to get more done. You know, I just got to get the right task manager. And I've, I've spent, I, I'm embarrassed to admit, but I've spent untold hours in the quest for the perfect task manager, thinking that if I got it, that would solve all my problems. Or the right system. Instead, we should ask a better question. What is the best possible use of my time? What is the best possible use of your time? With that lens, different daily priorities emerge. David Allen, who wrote the book Getting Things Done, famous for the GTD system, he said you can do anything you want. You just can't do everything you want. That forces us to choose, right? At Michael Hyde and Company, we believe that the best possible use of your time is work where you have both passion and proficiency. That's what creates the greatest impact. When you have passion plus proficiency, that's when you create leverage in your business. That's when you create leverage in your personal life. One of our clients, Tanya DeSalvo, learned this at a coaching intensity that we had here in Franklin at one of our all-day sessions. She learned about passion and proficiency. She was able to increase the net profit in her business from 20% to 43% on the same revenue and still enjoy more time off than she'd ever taken off before, based on what I'm about to share with you. This is going to seem very simple, but it became revolutionary. So I want to talk about passion. What is passion? Passion is what lights you up. It's what gets you out of bed in the morning. It's what gets you excited. It's what, if you could spend all your time doing this thing, or a couple of these things, that's how you would love to do it. But most of you have given up that that's even possible. Maybe there was a time in your work when you got to do those things, but now you're running a business. And you're doing less stuff that lights you up. So passion is that which you love to do. But it's not enough. You're in Nashville, Tennessee. When you go out to a restaurant here, there are all kinds of musicians waiting tables who have a passion for music. That's why they came to Nashville. But here's what they're missing. Proficiency. Maybe they thought they were proficient, but when they got in the big leagues and arrived here at Music City, they found they weren't as good as they thought. So proficiency... It's what you're good at and what drives results. It's got to drive the results that you've been hired to deliver. Passion plus proficiency. This all comes together in a tool, and we're going to do an exercise here in a minute, but in something we call the freedom compass. It's basically a four by four grid flipped 45 degrees. So when you have passion and proficiency, you have what we call the desire zone, true north. What are those for you? What are the things where you're passionate and proficient? Can you think of a few things? For me, it's creating content, delivering content like I'm doing today, or casting vision for my company. That's my lane. When I stay in that lane, I'm headed true north. I deliver the most value to my company, my, the most value to my clients. That's just how I'm wired. That's what I'm getting paid to do. And I love it. Now, when you're in your desire zone, here's what that feels like. Freedom. It's when you're working in your desire zone, 
It's, it's you look at your watch and it's noon and you go, where did the morning go? Because you were involved in something you loved. Now, the opposite of that is something I call the drudgery zone. This is the zero passion, zero proficiency zone. This is where you look at your watch thinking you've worked a couple of hours on a project and it's been five minutes. These things are different for everybody. Thank God. We have all different kinds of talent stacks and personality profiles and things that we like and things that we don't. In my particular case, for my drudgery zone, processing email, managing my calendar, booking travel, those things are in my drudgery zone. Fortunately, my executive assistant, Jim, those things are in his desire zone. So we complement one another well. And the thing about it is, he does them so much faster with so fewer mistakes because they're in his desire zone. Now, when you're in your drudgery zone, when you're operating down there, you know what it feels like? A grind. You know, that's like I'm saying. It's, it's, it's like, it's only been five minutes. Are you kidding me? Just shoot me. Okay, then there's the distraction zone. This is a very dangerous zone where you have passion but you don't have proficiency or you're not delivering the results that people are paying you to deliver and it's the place you go to escape. It's the realm of fake work. It's the realm of busy work. So for me when I started my company, uh, I knew it was going to be a content development, content delivery company, books and seminars and workshops and all the rest. But I needed a website, right? And so I found myself spending an inordinate amount of time in the back end of WordPress tweaking it. And I knew just enough to be dangerous. I know just enough PHP code to bring down the entire site. But it was a lot more fun and a lot more interesting than actually developing the content at the time or doing the things that took the deep work. It's where I was going to escape. Social media is like that for a lot of people. You know, you spend an inordinate amount of time there. You're not quite sure what the results are, but everybody says you got to be on social media. So you spend all this time there, and it's a whole lot easier than doing something else. So it's a place you go to escape. What is it for you? What's your distraction zone work that can derail you? Yeah, you got passion, but you're not that good. True story. When I hired my first web developer... I said, I, I really want you to take over and do all the, the back-end stuff of WordPress because I, I just got to focus on writing, generating the content. And he said, okay, I get it. He said, I'll do it on one condition. I said, what's that? He said, you never touch the back-end of WordPress again. And I said, okay, fair enough. He said, I want to know if the site comes down, I don't want to have anybody to blame but myself. And that was a great working relationship. Then there's the disinterest zone. This is where you have proficiency, but you've lost the passion, or maybe you never had it. Now, for a lot of entrepreneurs, the thing I find about the disinterest zone is that um, this is work they liked at one time. But let's, let's be honest, a lot of entrepreneurs get quickly bored. Is there anybody like that with me? Like, I can get excited about something for a couple weeks, and then I'm kind of on to the next thing. But this disinterest zone feels like boredom. It's when you keep watching the clock, you can't wait for the weekend, you kind of dread Mondays because the work bores you. I had a dentist in one of my programs who was incredibly bored and found out that working on people's mouths was in his disinterest zone. <laughs> That's a problem. And he had to figure out what it was that lit him up, what got him excited and get rid of the stuff that was in, in his disinterest zone. And it forced him to completely reinvent his business and take off. That's when he began to scale. And now he owns several clinics. Then there's an area I want to call your development zone right in the middle. This is just the area where you're going to park things that you're not quite sure of yet. You know, say, well, I kind of got some passion, but I don't really have the proficiency yet. But I think it might be important to my business, so I'm going to park it here and play with it for a while, but then eventually I'm going to force it into one of the other zones. So for me, 
that was definitely shooting video initially. I absolutely hated it. I wasn't any good at it, but I knew that it was going to be important to my business. So I let it stay parked in my development zone for a while until I gained the proficiency, and then I also developed some passion around it. Now I love it, but it wasn't initially the case. Don't use that as a cop-out to park everything, but there may be some things that you just suspect this is going to be important to the business, but I don't yet have the proficiency or I don't yet have the passion, but I'm going to stay with it for a little while and find out. Now, this is all mapped out in the book, which Jeff mentioned, Free to Focus, which you're going to get a copy of at the end of this presentation. Okay, I want us to do an exercise. On your table in front of you, you have something called a task filter. And we're going to just take five minutes to do this. And here's how it works. I want you to go back through your calendar or your task list for the last couple of weeks and write down as many discrete tasks as you can find. Maybe you attended this meeting, you prepared this proposal, you had this, you know, client uh, meeting, this phone call, whatever it is, list those. Then what I want you to do is to indicate whether you had passion or proficiency for those. Okay, don't do that at first, just list all the tasks, then go back and say, okay, did that really light me up? Was I excited about doing that? Is that something I enjoy? And then am I good at that? And then I want you to give it the zone name, okay? If you can remember, and I think it's on the second sheet there for you, but write down the zone name, okay? How many of you could have used another piece of paper? Yeah, probably everybody. Okay, now, now here's what we're going to do. I want you to map this to the Freedom Compass. There's a sample there for you. But you're just going to take your desire zone activities. I've got an example of somebody named Alicia, founder of an event management firm. I won't walk this through you for you, but all you need to do is to replicate this kind of thing with your list. And then I'm going to tell you why this is going to be useful to you. Okay? So we're going to take another five minutes to do this. Uh, the question came up, somebody said, well, I'm passionate about it, and I might even be proficient at it, but how do I know it's the right thing? So the question is, does it drive results, meaningful results in your business? I'll give an example. My oldest daughter, Megan, is the COO of our company. Megan is brilliant at interior design, and she loves doing it. You should see what she did with our offices. That is not a desire zone activity for her. Nobody's paying us to do interior design. So that automatically falls outside the scope of that. Let me tell you why this is so important before I get to step three. This is like the master key to overwhelm. If you want to get rid of overwhelm, the Freedom Compass is your ticket to do that. The goal is to spend more time in the desire zone and less time everywhere else. But how do you do that? In my book, Free to Focus, which you're getting a copy of, pay special attention to the second part of the book because I talk about three strategies to get rid of those three zones that you want to get rid of. Eliminate, automate, and delegate. I'm going to talk about delegation in a minute. But it's totally possible. I've had thousands of clients do this now. Your goal ought to be, and suspend disbelief, your goal ought to be where you're spending 95% of your time in your desire zone. What would happen to your life? What would happen to your business if that were true? If you were doing the high leverage things in your professional and in your personal life, I'm telling you, it'd be revolutionary. So you gotta start with planning, Step two, focus. Step three, execute. In order to get the double win, you can't just know what tasks matter and focus on them. You actually have to do them. Execution is like the holy grail of business. But why is execution so hard? Every company I know struggles with execution. Trying to eliminate sideways energy trying to get everybody aligned and moving in the same direction and just achieving our plans. I think the reason it's so hard is because we don't have a system to link our annual goals to our daily tasks. 
The linkage typically doesn't exist. That's why we came up with something that we call the three by three achievement system. We have a client just outside of Atlanta in a printing business. Bill Prettyman is his name. The printing business is a notoriously slow growth industry. Bill himself, before he became part of our coaching program, his business had only grown 2% year over year. That's the most he'd ever been able to max out of the business. After he learned this three by three achievement system, which I'm about to teach to you, he was able to take his business from $20 million a year in revenue and double that in 12 months. And he's on, path, on track to do that again this year. Now he's got more time as he's operating in his desire zone to think about innovation, to think about new customers, new market segments that he was never able to deal with because of the overwhelm, the tyranny of the urgent. So it all started with this system. Okay, first part of the three by three achievement system, quarterly big three goals. You ought to have three goals for every quarter. As the CEO, as the business owner, what are the three goals for the business this quarter? You say, but I got seven or 10. Here's the problem. Great book if you haven't read it, Four Disciplines of Execution. But they talk about a phenomenon called the whirlwind. Now you know what that is because you were in it before you got to this conference. And you're gonna be in it when you go back. The whirlwind consumes resources. It's business as usual and it consumes, consumes the bulk of your attention, your focus, your capital. A goal by definition is something that exists outside of the whirlwind. You've got to limit your focus to maximize your achievement. So three goals. Trust me, this works. Three clear goals. Then, three weekly big three objectives. There's a gazillion things you need to do next week when you get back, right? But what are the three highest leverage Biggest outcome goals that you could focus on. If you got those three done, you know, it'd be nice to do some other things, but if you got those three done, you'd count it as a good week. And then finally, the daily big three tasks. You may be thinking, three? Are you kidding me? I got a thousand things that I need to get done. I've got two pages worth of things that I need to get done. But you're thinking about this all wrong. Leadership isn't about getting more things done. It's about getting the right things done. That's what separates those who can scale and those who can't. The research shows that on average, people who use a task list start the day with 15 tasks. On average, 15 tasks that they need to get done that day. Typically, they begin the day feeling overwhelmed. Like, no way. No way I'm going to get those 15 things done today. They're defeated before they start. Even if they get eight things done, more than half, they end the day feeling defeated. What kind of day is that when you wake up overwhelmed and go to bed defeated? What kind of energy are you bringing to your team when you're walking around with that all the time? We got to get smarter about inventing a game, creating a game that we can win. Villafredo Pareto, an Italian economist, which may sound like an oxymoron, but he taught us that 20% of the effort drives 80% of the results. 20% of the effort drives 80% of the results. You know this to be true. 20% of your clients probably account for 80% of your profit, right? 20% of your customer service headaches you know, or 20% of your customers account for 80% of the headaches. I mean, it works in a lot of different areas. But let's apply this to the task list. If the average person has 15 tasks, and if 20% are going to drive the results, then magically, the daily big three. What are the three that are going to drive the most significant tasks that if you could achieve them today, you'd count it as a win? And your head would hit the pillow and you'd celebrate a little bit because you thought, I didn't get everything done, but I got the most important things done. That's the daily big three, okay? Don't be deceived by the simplicity of this. This all comes together in our full focus planner. Are any of you using the full focus planner? 
It's an analog planner tool. And I, <laughs> awesome. I have people uh, say to me all the time, they used to make fun of me when we first published this about two years ago. They're like, hello, you know, it's 2018. We have smartphones. Well, here's the problem. When you try to manage your task list in that kind of digital chaos, no wonder things get lost. There's something about, and we got the science to prove this, and I don't have time to go into it today, but when you pull your task list out of that kind of digital chaos into an analog environment, it's amazing what it does for your focus. So the Full Focus Planner is a way to do that. Okay, step four. There's three by three execution or achievement system. Now let's talk about scaling because that's what everybody wants to get. Everybody wants to grow, right? Everybody wants to scale. It's where it all comes together. But here's kind of the, the dirty little secret of scaling. In order to scale your business, you have to scale yourself. That's kind of where it starts. Because if you can't do that, then there's what John Maxwell calls the law of the lid. In other words, a business can never grow beyond your own capacity. And most of you are already strung out, doing too much. So how do you scale yourself? And I think, first of all, it starts, scaling has two aspects. And the first part of this is you've got to leverage the talents of a team. In fact, I would say this. If your dream doesn't require a team, your dream isn't big enough. And, and sometimes I meet business owners who kind of resent having to have a team. You know, all the management headaches, you know, meeting a payroll and all the responsibility and stress that comes with that. You know, trying to retain people and trying to find new people, especially in this environment where it's so easy for people to get a job, it's tough. But a team is the ticket to being able to scale yourself. But you've got to learn to delegate. And most leaders I know struggle with delegation. And I want to talk about quickly three mistakes that leaders make when it comes to delegation. And I've made all of these. First of all, they hesitate. It's like they know they need to hand it off but they hesitate and they don't hand it off. Now, why? I would submit that it's because of at least three limiting beliefs. Now, a limiting belief typically shows up in your head as a sentence. You're not usually conscious of it, but as I say this sentence, let me know if, this, if you've ever said this to yourself. If I want it done right, I have to do it What? Myself, right? You can complete the sentence because you've said it many times to yourself. Or maybe you said this to yourself. You said, um, it takes longer to explain how to do it. I might as well just do it myself, right? You said that too. Or maybe you said to yourself, you know, I really can't afford to hire somebody else right now. I guess I'm just going to have to do it, what? Myself. I, I, I use this one for years but here's the thing I finally realized. Does it make sense for me to do a job, like let's just, just I'm making this up, but let's just say I make $100 an hour, and I could pay somebody $20 an hour to do that thing? Does it make sense for me to be paying myself, essentially, $100 an hour to be doing a $20 an hour task? No, that's bad math. It's stupid. And when I hired my first executive assistant, which I did as a virtual assistant on a part-time basis, five hours a week, guess what that freed me up to do? Go find new clients. Go do things that I could bill for. And oh, by the way, those were the things that my desire zone, the things that I love doing. Not all this administrative stuff. So we've got to get past the hesitation, overcome the limiting beliefs, and be willing to delegate. So the next time one of those limiting beliefs shows up as a sentence in your head, I want you to remember this talk and go, oh, I can't hesitate. If I want to scale, i got to learn to delegate, so I'm going to do it. Here's another reason or another mistake that leaders make when it comes to delegation. They abdicate. They abdicate. This is what I call the dump and run strategy. You're already overwhelmed. You're already busy. You're already harried. So you walk by an associate's desk and you hand off something to them with little or no explanation. Then they delivered a few weeks later, and you're profoundly disappointed. 
And you tell one of your peers when you come to a conference like this, I just need better people. You know, my people don't get it. I don't understand why they can't deliver, you know, to my expectations. Here's why nobody can read your mind. Not your wife, not your husband, not your best friend, not the people in your company. Nobody can read your mind. And you've got to learn, I've got to learn to be explicit, to be concrete, to make clearer my expectations, to define the win on the front end. And I got a lot more on that in Free to Focus, including the five levels of delegation. But you can't just abdicate. You can't dump and run. You've got to take some moments to explain it. Otherwise, you're going to get a result you're not happy with. But here's another mistake. Suffocate. Micromanage. How many of you just love being micromanaged? One person. None of us do, right? None of us love it. I quit a job that I had at one point as an editor in a book publishing company. At that point, that was my dream job. I loved the job. But like a, like a week into the job, my boss came to me and he said, I want you to keep a time log of how you spend every 15 minutes. And then at the end of the day, we're going to talk through that. I mean, like after a few days, I thought I was going to pull my hair out. And I started looking immediately for another job. I stayed in that job six months. That's why I moved to Nashville, was to take another job because I didn't like being micromanaged. Nothing slowed out, slows down momentum in an organization like micromanagement. Daniel Pink, in his book Drive, says that one of the three reasons why people stay, why you retain people, is they have to have relative autonomy. Not absolute autonomy. I mean, all of us have accountability. We need to check in, check the brew from time to time. But people need to feel like they're trusted and they can do the work. So you can't suffocate either. So effective delegation is critical to double win leadership. Let me go back to that. To double win success. This is what allows you to unplug from work for significant periods of time. I take 30 days off every summer with my wife. And we go away, I have zero contact with the business. It's a great stress test for the health of the business. I couldn't do that if I didn't delegate. Delegation is essential if you're going to achieve more by doing less. In addition to that, in addition to the delegation, you and I, if we're going to grow, have to level up our leadership. Here's what I mean by that. My business grew 62% last year. That means that the company I was running last year was a completely different company than I was running the prior year. And as a result, I had to be a completely different kind of CEO in a company that was that much larger. Same thing is true for you. If you're growing, your leadership has to level up and it has to outpace the growth of the company. It's critical. And it starts by taking an honest assessment of where you and your business are now. I know that some of you have already taken our leadership health assessment, I mean our business health assessment. How many of you have taken this already? It's just a quick gauge that we use with our clients to find out exactly how they're doing and how their business is doing. You can take it here at businessaccelerator.com slash toolkit if you haven't taken it. But I want to give you the kind of the results of this because I think it's instructive. If you're serious about double win success, it's important that you understand how this turns out. So we've had over 10,000 people take that business health assessment now. The first block of people that take it are in what we call survival. These are people that are having a difficult time making payroll. They're struggling for their very existence. They're not sure if they're going to survive. And you guys probably know this. This is U.S. Department of Commerce says that 80% of all businesses that start this year will not be around in five years. And 80% of those, or the 20% that are left, 80% of those will not survive until they get to 10 years. But at least in self-evaluation, about 88% of the people that take this end up in survival, or assess themselves in survival. Then there's what we call frustration. This is where, you know, it's better than survival. You're at least out of survival. It's three steps forward, two steps back. 
Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. Sometimes things work, sometimes they don't. You're not quite sure why, but it's kind of a zigzag movement. And this is the largest block of the people that take this, about 58%. Then there's what we would call success. And these are people that have positive cash flow, they're making money, systems are working, they're still struggling a bit on some things, but you know, usually it's around process and hiring and those kind of things, but overall, at least all outside observers, it looks like a success. But it's usually single-sided success. Their business may be working, but their health, their family, some of these other areas aren't working so well. Then there's the area that I love. This is where the double win resides. This is transformation. This is where people are experiencing the double win. They feel like they're in good health. Their relationships are intact. And they have a growing business that's highly profitable. Only about 2% of the people that have taken the assessment end up in that category. Here's the good news. No matter where you fall out on this, the future is not fixed. So I want to show you another model. Just imagine for a moment that this box on the left is your current business reality, whatever it is. We know that just through the passage of time, there's going to be a future business reality. Maybe it's a year from now, maybe it's three years from now, maybe it's 10 years from now. But again, the future is not static. There's going to be a future reality. Could get better, could get worse. For example, regardless of where you are now, you could end up in a few years in survival. Where all of a sudden you're fighting for your life. That happened to me when I was at Thomas Nelson trying to manage that business through the recession. All of a sudden we had a big storm, the banking industry collapsed, and oh my gosh, we were suddenly fighting for our lives. Then maybe you're going to end up in the area of frustration. We're doing a little bit better than that, but it's frustrating. Like I said, three steps forward, two steps back. Maybe you end up in success. Or maybe you're one of the lucky few, the intentional few, that end up in transformation. Now, the interesting thing about moving from where you are to where you are now is it's not typically a straight line. In fact, the line from your current business reality to survival is oftentimes more exponential. You know, it gains speed and momentum over time. Maybe the drift to frustration is a little bit more incremental. Same thing with success. But transformation, there's something about that when you hit an inflection point and you're cooking, you know, on, I think I'm about to mix my metaphor, you're firing, that's what I wanted to look for, firing on all cylinders, that everything just suddenly starts working. And that leads to transformation. Now, if you want to jump the line, maybe you want to go from frustration to transformation, if you wait to some point in the future, it's going to be harder, riskier, and more expensive. You may feel like wherever you're at right now that you're a long way away from where you want to be. But here's the reality. You've never been closer than you are right now. Every single one of you. It's never going to be easier, cheaper, or easier to jump the line than it is now. It may not be easy, but this is the best time to do it. And the reason for that is that over time, we drift. And like I said before, we usually drift to a destination we would not have chosen. The way you combat the drift is to design. To design. Design the future. That goes all the way back to step one, to have a vision for something different. The best way I know to do that is to connect with the right coach. And kudos to you for being in this kind of coaching program. I I literally have had a coach for 20 years or been part of coaching programs for 20 years. I would say it's the single biggest secret to whatever success I've experienced. The right coach can help you go further, faster than you could otherwise. Now... In case you ever consider another coaching program or you're trying to articulate to somebody else why they need to be involved in coaching, three questions to ask. Does the coach you're considering, do they have the right experience? 
There's a lot of coaching out there. This, this coaching program you're a part of is an exception. You know that, right? Because most coaching programs that are out there in the market are facilitated by people that went to a week-long certification program and they don't have any operating experience. They've never run a business. You want, your friends that are interested in a coach, you want them to have a coach that has the right experience, that's run a business, that's struggled you know, with the, the challenges of meeting a payroll and scaling a business and all the rest. Do they get the right results? Some are good in theory, but the metrics tell it all. Are they walking their talk? Are they getting the right results in their own life? And can they point to client results? Third criteria, third question, do they offer the right format? One of the reasons Jeff and I connected when he started talking about this program and we were having dinner is I thought, oh, you get it. Because the right format is group coaching. There's a place for one-on-one -on -one coaching. We do that too in our company. But there is power in group coaching. I think it's 10 times more powerful than one-on-one -on -one coaching for most people. And the reason for that is because you get the advantage of a guide who's giving you new content, new skills, new information, but the peer support. You build a peer group that you could not build for yourself. People often tell me in my coaching program, we came for you, but we stayed for the community. And I know this group is extraordinary. So again, if you haven't taken the business health assessment, let me encourage you to do that. That's it. That you are there. Uh, there. I'm about to finish up, I, wanted, I started today with a conversation that I had with my wife, Gail, in the den. Almost two days ago. That was the day I felt like I was facing this impossible choice. That day turned out to be a gift because it was at that moment that things began to change. Didn't happen all at once. I don't need to tell you that. It was a journey. It still is a journey. But over time, I discovered this four-step double win system. Plan, focus, execute, scale. It's deceptively simple. But rinse and repeat. It works. In our own business, we loop back through that over and over again. Same thing for our clients. So I want to close with a... Um, story that happened last summer. My wife and I, as I mentioned, take a 30-day sabbatical every summer. I would really recommend that. What would have to be true in your business for you to be able to do that? It is so rejuvenating. We went to Jackson Hole, Wyoming for two of those four weeks. We fly fished. By the way, do you know how awesome it is to have a spouse that loves to fly fish with you? I mean, that's just, I feel like I won the jackpot. But we fly fished on those rivers in Wyoming. We hiked. We took a bunch of naps. It was incredible. It was so rejuvenating. But on the day before we were to fly out, she said to me, she said, babe, tomorrow I'd like to get up early and catch the sunrise. And I said, what do you mean by early? And she said, well, nope. we're going to have to get up at 4 a.m., to see the sunrise. And I said, really? And she said, yeah, it's really important to me. And then I want to go hiking. I said, okay, let's do it. So the alarm goes off on the next morning, right before we're going to fly out later that afternoon. I was so tempted to hit the snooze button, but I didn't. And if I had, I would have missed that sunrise, which I took just outside of Jackson, Wyoming on my iPhone. It was phenomenal. It was beautiful. So after we enjoyed the sun there, we, we drove to Jenny Lake. We took the ferry over to kind of the mountainside of it where the Tetons were. And we climbed up the mountain to Inspiration Point. There was just a hiking trail that was pretty steep. So when we got to the top, we sat down. We were kind of catching our breath, just taking it all in. Because from that point, Inspiration Point, it's not called that for nothing. You can see the entire Jackson Hole Valley, and it's breathtaking. And after a few minutes, Gail took my hand and she said, honey, I just want to thank you for making this time for us and for always making me a priority. And I could not help but flash back to that conversation in the den and how far we had come.
And again, like I said, it wasn't overnight. It's been a journey. You know, we still have challenges. But that moment was worth it all. I want to ask you to do something with me. Work with me. I want you to close your eyes because I want you to imagine something in the future as we close here. Imagine a day. Imagine a day in the future when your business is growing exponentially, but you aren't working more hours. In fact, you're working fewer hours. You're taking more time off than ever before. Time off from the business completely unplugged and nothing falls through the cracks. Imagine a day when you're winning at work and succeeding at life. A day when you have the business you dreamed of and a life you love. Again, you're not going to drift to that kind of reality. You've got to create it. Today is the day to jump the line and change the trajectory of your future. So let me just encourage you. Don't hit the snooze button. Don't hit the snooze button. It's time to wake up, get started, create a different outcome. Thank you very much. Do you have any questions? Yeah. Is that good? All right. We've got about five minutes here. If you guys uh, have any questions, we can come up to the mic. I know Ron actually had a question here that, Steve, go ahead and go to the mic there, but uh, Ron was asking, I don't know, I, I stepped out, I don't know if you addressed it, is when you're putting things in your, your passion zone and you're proficient at it and you really like doing it, how do you know when to move that out if it's not the right thing to be doing as the CEO of your organization? I, I did address that, actually. Okay, perfect. But I can address it again. Sure. <laughs> but again, what you want to make sure is that it's driving the results you want in your business. You may love it, you may be good at it, but if it's not driving the results, don't put it in your desire zone. Okay. Steve. Okay, so for some of, the, some of us that did our homework and did that assessment, where do we get information about what the results mean? You should have got an email with well, that in it. I got the score, but it didn't tell me more. But okay, I need to go back and look at that. I don't know if that's a follow-up email. Sorry, I don't know that part of my okay. the system. Okay. Yeah. So you mentioned at one point that you need to be leveling up your leadership at a faster pace than your business is growing. How do you go about that, and do you have any suggestions for somebody who wants to achieve that? Yes, that's a great question. I think you have to cultivate a growth mindset, you know, and I think that you almost got to be like a shark that's always swimming, always growing. And so for me, it looks like I'm constantly reading. Um, I'm involved in a coaching program. I'm involved in another mastermind. You know, I'm involved in things that give new input so that I can get new knowledge and new experience. Thank you. Yep. And by the way, one of the best ways to do that is to bake it into your daily ritual. And I talk about that in Free to Focus. But like, for example, for me, I exercise for an hour every morning. And at the same time, I'm listening to audiobooks. So it's a great way to kill two birds with one stone. Yeah. So one of the things I think that um, we struggle a lot with is delegation, delegating in. So the micromanaging, I was wondering if there's something specific that you could deline, delineate where, you're, where you need to stop the micromanaging or where, what is micromanaging rather than just average managing or what you're supposed to be doing. There's actually a form in the book Free to Focus, a form that we use with our clients and in our own business called a Project Vision Caster. Just a one-page document. Sometimes it can bleed over into two. But it's basically where we describe the outcome that we want, the big why of the project, why this is important. And then we talk about what a clear win looks like. And there's a few other minor things, but those are the, ba the basic three. So what does this project look like when it's done? So what that means is it, it forces me to get clear because I have to write it. And then I meet with the delegate. And then I describe it. I also indicate when the check-in points are going to be so that I can monitor progress because I don't want to micromanage them. But at the same time, I don't want to abdicate. So I'm going to have certain defined check-in times on the delegation. Does that make sense? So look, look for that form, Project Vision Caster. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, la last question. Kind of similar to what she was asking, but I live in this. This is like speaking to me. This, I love to have my three tasks for the day but my business partners, not so much, or maybe some of the um, other managers on my team. So how do you 
spread the word and get everybody kind of on that same focus page because I feel like a lot of times we're just uh, putting out fires and not staying focused on what our tasks are, our well, goals are for that quarter or that year. Yeah, we, we do actually have an event here in Nashville that we do. It's a one-day event called the Focused Leader. And a lot of people that have been exposed to our stuff bring their team members back to that, which gives them a common language. And it also gives them a common tool because we teach using the Full Focus Planner. And then everybody's literally on the same page with that. And a lot of our clients have just said that's been transformative. And we've done, we've done trainings in big corporations with that too.